Aaron. So first of all, hello everyone. Thank you all for coming to the meeting. Today, we are very happy to welcome the second of our speakers from the Asperger's Autism Network, also known as the ANNE, based in Boston, for our May meeting. So our speaker today is Betty Hallenbeck, and she will be talking to us about ANNE's programs, which are designed to support individuals with Asperger's slash high-functioning autism. Hey, so I'm Betty, and I'm going to talk to you about our Life Map and Life Net programs at AANE. Uh, I thought I'd start by just telling you a little bit about me. I've taught public school special education around the United States for many, many years in, goodness, in Virginia, in Oregon, in Utah, um, several places. I have a PhD in special education from the University of Virginia. I've taught at several two and four year colleges and universities at the undergraduate and graduate levels. And I'm the parent of a wonderful 27, soon to be 28 year old who identifies himself as having Asperger's syndrome. I also have a, a brother who says that he has Asperger's and my dad was to me quite clearly on the spectrum. I've been working with AANE now for about five years and I absolutely love it. It's, it's an amazing organization to work for. Can't say enough good things about it. We have more programs than I could possibly cover with you from child and family services to adult services to so many social opportunities right now. We've recently started an improv group. We have a writer's club. We have women's groups. We have a knitting group. Um, we have just so many opportunities available. Um, and in an, in an odd way, I think everything going virtual has allowed us to expand in ways that we never would have otherwise. And by the way, I'm not a formal sort of presenter. So if you have questions, please just ask. Um, you don't need to wait or anything. I'm happy to answer your questions at any point. Just a little bit about AANE. We're actually celebrating our 25th anniversary this year, which for an organization devoted to Asperger's and autism is quite a long history. Um, our executive director, Danya Jekyll, is leaving in October and Brenda Dater will be taking over as our executive director at that point. Life map programs, uh, which I'm gonna talk about first, began in 2008 with a grant from uh, what in Massachusetts is called DDS. I don't know the Canadian equivalent, but it's the Department of Developmental Services um, serving all adults with developmental disabilities. LifeNet is a newer program for us, which began in 2019. And I'll also talk a bit about that today as well. Life map at this point, um, we have over 60 coaches. We just trained five more today. We're training more next week because we have never ever had the level of applications that we have right now. Uh, prior to the pandemic, if we had 20 to 30 applications in a month, that was a very heavy month for us. Now we're averaging closer to 60 to 70 applications a month for people to join life map, which is absolutely astonishing. Um, we have 60 coaches, as I said, but it's growing, and almost all of those have master's or doctoral level training. The majority of our coaches have a family member with Asperger's autism or a related profile. We do have coaches who identify as being on the spectrum themselves, and we've noticed a trend in the last six months in particular uh, among incoming clients that they will request a coach who's on the spectrum which we find very interesting. They say, I would like to work with someone like me who has actually experienced my struggles. Um, so we're, we're looking for more of those coaches at the moment since demand seems to be going up. Where in the past we met almost exclusively in person around Massachusetts and New York, we now coach clients everywhere in the world at this point, from Iraq to Costa Rica to all over Canada. Um, I think we actually just got a client in the Nunavut province, which amazes me. My brother used to guide river trips up there. So I think that might be our, our most remote current Canadian client. Uh, and our clients right now range from our youngest that we've ever accepted. We just took her in last month and she's 15 and a half. And our oldest client is 86. Um, 
When we are thinking about our clients and who's a good fit for coaching, we look for people who are at least 16 years of age, generally. Uh, as I mentioned, we did just take a 15 and a half year old, but she's quite an exceptional young woman. Uh, we don't require a formal diagnosis. Joette, I think I heard you talking about this related to housing. We don't require that they come to us with a formal diagnosis. Certainly some of our clients have that and have been diagnosed for years. Some just sort of identify with the profile of our clients quite heavily. Um, some will say, I have PDD-NOS, I have a nonverbal learning disorder, I have a social communication disorder. The name is less important to us than the struggles that the client or potential client is facing. We look for clients who have the capacity to be an active part of the coaching process. Um, and a challenge we're facing now that's actually quite new to us is a lot of parents of, I would say, 18 to 25 year olds who have those people at home or maybe back at home are reaching out to us and saying, my son or daughter has to do coaching. A requirement to continue living in my house is they must work with a coach. And often those clients start into the coaching process and they just flat out do not want to be there. That's a challenge for our coach because unless we have buy-in from the client, the whole process is not gonna go particularly well. Um, we like our clients to be able to identify goals and that looks so different in different clients. We have clients who just at this point will say, I want my life to be better. I want more people in my life. And then we have the clients who come with the formal outline with the capital letter A and then the lowercase letter A and the, the bullet points one, two, and three underneath. And they have goals and outlines for the next 30 years of their lives. Um, it's important to us that somehow the client has a desire to be a part of this process and that they're open to trying to acquire some new skills or try new methods for things. And in general, we look for at least 10 coaching sessions one of our funding streams is a, a series of different companies in the United States who, who pay for scholarships for our clients, and they will usually pay for 10 coaching sessions at a time. Again, our, our average client will come to us with a diagnosis of Asperger's or autism. Uh, we also have clients who just don't want us to use those words. So what, from the moment that we start interacting with a client, we are careful to ask, how do you refer to yourself? If their preferred term is, I have an executive functioning disorder, that's what we'll use. Um, if they just say, I am an introvert, we'll go with that. Um, they, they do need to be 16 and up to work with us. They have to be open and willing to participate uh, and then the last one has become more of an issue for us during the pandemic than ever before. If a client also has several significant or a significant mental health challenge, we require that they're working with a therapist or psychiatrist because we are not mental health professionals. We're not crisis care professionals. So we can't be doing that. Um, one question that comes up very early in our process is what is coaching? Oftentimes our clients and their families are not sure. What does this coaching thing that you do? What does that mean? Uh, the International Coaching Federation says that coaching is a partnership and a creative process where a coach and a client work together to, to help the client grow in any way, personally or professionally. It also says that coaches are responsible to discover, um, clarify and align things what the client wants to achieve. We encourage client self-discovery. We work hard to try to come up with client-generated solutions. And again, this is going to vary so much. Some of our clients, we sort of give a, a gentle suggestion and they're off to the races and they have 15 possible solutions they're willing to try. Other clients uh, in this remote time, we're screen sharing with them going on websites with them, looking together, trying to find solutions together more collaboratively. Uh, and one of the things that almost all of our clients say is they like coaching because it provides some accountability. And again, I'm hearing this more during the pandemic than I was beforehand. 
the days, a uh, hair client said, the days run together. I don't even know what day of the week it is anymore, but I know I'm seeing you on Wednesday and I know that I had these tasks to be done by Wednesday and it really helps to have that appointment. I have a client at this point, someone I've worked with for a long time and I'm only meeting with him once a month. And I asked recently, if you feel like you want to continue? And he said, oh, without the once a month with you, everything would just fall apart again. So just knowing that that one time a month, he's going to report to me how his month went, seems to be making a difference for him. Coaching uh, is a partnership, and that feels different to a lot of our clients. Some like it. Uh, we hear from many clients that I've been in therapy. I did an intake on a wonderful young man yesterday who said, I've been to 12 therapists and none of them helped me. Um, so he felt like therapy was not the path for him. And when I explained that coaching is not really hierarchical, hierarchical, it is more of a collaboration. He said, I think that will work better for me. I need to be a part of the process for it to work. Uh, we don't offer answers necessarily to our clients, but we help them find them. We're kind of like a mentor, a cheerleader, and a professional support person rolled into one. And a lot of our role is really just observing the client and asking questions. Um, and the last one is one that particularly interests me as a coach. We help the client understand the neurotypical world. I often tell clients, one of the challenges that they, I believe our clients have faced is that they were brought up in the world and sort of treated by people as if they were neurotypical. And the, to the extent that they were given an owner's manual for themselves, it was the owner's manual for a neurotypical person. And that doesn't work. Uh, my son says, I have Asperger's, it's not a disability, it's a different operating system, like a Mac and a PC, and I absolutely love that. He says they're good at different things. So to use his analogy, our clients are given a PC instruction manual, but they're Macs, it doesn't work. So I think some of the most important work we do with clients is helping them understand their own profile, translate it to people in the neurotypical world, and then understand neurotypical people and be able to interact with them a bit less awkwardly and with a bit less stress. We do also have our own profess professional association called the AAPCA, which is the Asperger's Autism Professional Coaching Association. And uh, coaches who work with anybody on the spectrum, whether or not they work for AANE are welcome to join that organization. So yeah. Betty, can I ask a question? Of course, please. Regarding the, the idea of, I too like this uh, metaphor of a different operating system. Mm -hmm. However, um, you, we also ask that people come to our programs and workshops motivated and are interested in um, acquiring skills some of the time. Sometimes some things are just for fun and socialization, but, it, but some of course. Things. And mm -hmm. so the, the difficulty is some people here, you're asking me to make myself over, to be different from what I am. How do you find you balance that um, between um, understanding that the world is not going to bend over backwards? I think we need to um, make more awareness and to ask that the world be more accommodating. But in large measure, you need to translate, you need to communicate. And, um, and that means that the individuals on the spectrum also have to learn to communicate to the neurotypical individuals. And sometimes just to make their life easier, they need to pick up some skills and to adapt their way of operating so that they get by without, um, I don't mean get by in that they pass, I mean get by in that there is less conflict and stress in their life. Exactly, and, so and yeah. I, that, that's a, the question I'm asking. How do we do that? How do we communicate? We're not asking for you to, to feel wrong or that you're asking, asking you to make yourself over, but we are asking that you take on some new skills, be motivated to, um, to be adaptable. We, we get fairly explicit with our clients. Um, it, 
a place where this comes up often is either in the classroom or in the workplace. And they'll say, I'm doing this and my boss doesn't like it. And so we will sort of map out with them, what do you suppose will, continue, will happen if you continue with that behavior? And your boss has told you they don't like it and maybe they put a letter in your file saying they don't like it. Where do you think that story will end? And if they can't get there, we might sort of help scaffold them along for them. Um, okay, so have you asked your boss what you could do differently? And if they haven't, then that would be our next suggestion. And if necessary, our coach might go with them into a Zoom meeting with the boss and facilitate that conversation. When we have a clear picture of what it is that their boss or their professor or their teacher wants them to do differently, then we will have a really frank conversation about um, are, is this something you would consider doing? Are you aware that by saying, no, I won't do that, you could lose your job. You could not pass this class. You, your parents could say you can't live at home anymore. So we make sort of the outcome of, of their choice clear to them. And then if they say, often they'll say, I am willing to change it. I don't know how. We can help with that. We can break it down into tiny steps and increments, and we can help them demonstrate to a boss or parent or teacher that they're moving in that direction. But it is, it's a very delicate balance. Um, and especially many of our older clients will come to us and say, I've been masking who I am my whole life and I'm done with it. I just need to be who I am and how I am. Um, and that's, that's tricky because that could cost them some things in the long run. But ultimately, I think it's their decision as long as they're clearly aware that continuing on the path they're going on will likely have a certain outcome. Uh, what we find is often they don't know that. Well, my boss will just put another letter in my file. Well, after three or four letters, what do you think will happen? I'll just get another letter. Well, it's possible your boss would tell you you can't keep your job. I didn't realize that. Okay, so we're looking at changing your behavior and keeping your job. Let's, let's talk about those two things and where you come down on the, on the side of either one of those. I don't know if that's helpful or not. Yes, thank you. Yes, it's very complicated though. It's very, very difficult. Um, and that balance, I, I agree with you. I'd love to see the world embrace a bit more who our clients are and how they are in the world. Um, I do some work at a local high school where students on the spectrum take an entire year of social thinking class, which if I'm having a bad day, I'll just go and hang out in their class because it's, it's just so uplifting. And they can raise their hand and ask to take what they call a time which is time to just do the stimming they need to do or go in the bathroom and wa run water over their hands. And the last time I was in there, uh, one young woman said with just a lot of passion in her voice, won't it be great when we can flap our hands and the whole world will just say, look, she's feeling really happy today. And I, I loved that. Um, and I think those kinds of accommodations are possible. At the same time though, I think that young woman has to realize that other things that she does might have a cost for her down the road and that it, she has the choice to either change them and possibly avoid a cost she doesn't want to pay or continue with them and then there will be a, a certain consequence. That makes it sound so much easier than it is though, I know. <laughs> we are really focused on measuring success for a couple of reasons. It helps us assess our program as a whole uh, but I also feel that it's incredibly important uh, to show our clients their own progress. In general, our clients can tell us everything that they've done wrong in their lives. In our intake, we have a question where we ask about strengths and challenges. Strengths is usually just silence. I don't know. Sometimes they'll say, I'm detail-oriented. I have a good memory. Maybe one or two. But then challenges, they'll give you a laundry list pages long. So I feel like our clients have not developed a habit of seeing their own successes, of seeing their own progress. And the way that we work on that is these two measures that we use. The first is something called an anxiety confidence measure. 
So if a client's goal is, um, I will talk with someone outside of my family three times a week. That might be a goal that a client would have right now. We have them write that as a goal. And then we have them on a, a Likert scale, kind of a one to five scale say, how anxious do you feel when you think about doing this? And many of them will say, oh, that's a four out of five. That makes me very anxious to think about talking to someone outside of my family. How confident are you that you can achieve this goal? A one out of five. I, I'm not sure I can do it at all. Uh, the functional skills assessment is just what it sounds like, a list of skills, and they rate themselves at how well they do them independently. Every eight weeks, we go back through these with clients, and that lets the client and the coach see that they're making progress. Uh, and I think that's one of the most important things that we do for our clients is get them in that mindset of looking at their own progress and making it very visible to them. Because I often feel that they haven't, haven't noticed that in the past. When a client leaves our program, we write a summary report and we identify steps for the future. Often clients come to us, they're with us for a certain amount of time. Let's say their goal is independent living. They get in an apartment, they're doing fine. They say, I don't need coaching anymore. They, we write a final report and they're gone for a bit. Then something changes at their job. They're offered a promotion. A new supervisor is hired, something changes. Um, in one case that comes to mind, the boss of the company bought all new office furniture and that set one of our clients off to the point that he was at the risk of losing his job because of the office furniture. He didn't like the chair he was being made to sit in. Whatever the circumstance, then the client often comes back into coaching with us for a period of time. So it's sort of a fluid process where clients can come and go um, as they choose to. And then a bit down the road after they've left coaching, we do check in with them and take a survey. Uh, if their parents have been involved, if therapist has been involved, we also ask them to report to us changes they've seen in the client. We do have three universities that conduct uh, research on our clients and they have found that through coaching, our clients have a markedly improved ability to identify goals for themselves. They will say, I have a decreased need for coaching or other supports. They report less anxiety and more confidence generally. They Almost all of our clients say, I'm better at managing my time. I'm better at keeping my space clean. I can set up routines for myself. If my routine gets thrown off, I can roll with that a little better than I used to be able to. And uh, clients and third party folks who know our clients report a huge improvement in things like dress and hygiene and self-care through coaching. So here's the process, start to finish. Um, and right now, as I said, we're, we're having these at a rate that we've never, ever had before. Um, some weeks, as many as 20 intakes in a week, which is a lot for us. We're definitely feeling growing pains in this virtual world. But the first step is that we have an informational phone call with the client, or if it's a younger client or a client with a lot of anxiety, it might be the client and a parent client and a grandparent, client and a spouse, um, client and someone from one of the agencies that we work with. But in that phone call, we just describe what coaching is to them. It's just sort of an introduction for them of what our program is. And it's our first opportunity to get a sense of if this is a good client for LifeMap or not. Assuming everybody wants to move on after that, we do an intake that's about an hour and a half long. And if you're interested, I'd be happy to share all the forms we use for this with you too. Mm -hmm. Thank the you. It's quite detailed. We take a very thorough uh, medical history. We take an employment history, school history, um, information about their current living situation, um, their own perception of strengths and weaknesses. We try to see if they can identify goals that they want, want to work on. Uh, I would say another really important part of the intake for us, again, especially with our younger clients, they often want a parent there during the intake. And it's a chance for us to see 
how much the client is speaking up and how much the parent or grandparent or spouse is speaking for them. Uh, and in this virtual world now, we've tried to get at least 15 minutes of the intake to be the client without anybody else present. Obviously, we don't force that past the point that you know, we're making a client tremendously anxious or something. But we do try to see how they, how they are able to function without a parent there. Um, I'm thinking of a young man we recently started working with who is certainly at, has more challenges than many of our clients. And during his intake, I asked what medications he's on. And he got a bit flustered and said, there are a lot, there are a whole lot. I can't remember. Mom, you take this one. Uh, and what was very encouraging to me is his mom said, oh, no, you can do this. She said, close your eyes, picture your list, and here's your one hint. The first one starts with K. And with that, he was able to start the list, and he gave me all of them, names, what they were for, everything. Um, and I thought that was really lovely that his mom supported him a little, but she didn't just take it over for him and give us the entire list herself. She kind of gave him the ability to do that. After the intake, we look at the intake information and we look at our coaches and we make the match. Um, this has gotten harder, honestly, because we're on the East Coast and we have more and more and more clients on the West Coast. I just did an intake from Orcas Island, Washington, and the client works and wants to start coaching when he gets home from work about six o'clock. That's nine o'clock our time. <laughs> Um, and it's hard to find a coach who's wanting to coach from 9 to 10 at night. But we do the, the coach assignment. Uh, we introduce the coach to the client via email, and then they begin meeting together. In the first session, assuming the client's up for it, the coach and client work on goals together based on the client's current needs. Uh, that said, some of our clients might take a couple sessions to even get to that point. I'm finding that clients who have maybe been in their room all day playing video games and not interacting with anybody, it takes a little longer to build a bridge and build a connection to our coach to build some trust there. So it might take longer than the first session before they're really ready to get into goals. At that point, coaching continues. Most of our clients meet with a coach one hour a week. Uh, we have a a small number of clients through the DDS agency who have up to three hours a week allotted to them. We have a, also a small number of clients. I have a client who cannot sustain attention for an hour at a time. So he and I actually, during the semester, we meet for 15 minutes, four times a week in the morning. So it, it comes out to be an hour, but we meet Monday through Thursday, first thing in the morning and kind of get his day organized and off to a good start for him. After each meeting, our coaches make clinical notes, which are mostly for themselves, uh, but our supervisors, including myself, do look at those. We have monthly reports that are turned in for our own information and also all of the agencies that are funding sources for us require monthly reports on our clients, so we do those. And then, as I mentioned, every eight weeks, we go back and do the anxiety confidence measures and the functional skills assessment. And when we finally complete coaching, then we write a final report and the, the clients are surveyed about how things went and how they think they changed. Questions about any of that? It's a really complicated process and I went through it super fast. Yes, I, I do. Um, yes, I had a question about um, the matching of the coaches and the clients because I mean, yes. sometimes, sometimes they just, you know, there's something in a personality or something that would match. So what happened if it doesn't work? Do you have an option to change your coach? Absolutely. Or? We will reassign. If it doesn't work, um, sometimes, as you say, it's just a matter of the chemistry. They just don't click together. And if that happens, we'll reassign. Um, we also sometimes have to reassign for scheduling reasons. Our coaches are busy. Many of them have another job and they do coaching. And so if the client says to the coach, the only time I can meet with you is Tuesday at one o'clock and the coach simply can't do that, then we might have to reassign as well. We try to avoid those in the process, uh, but we do periodically have to reassign them. Okay. Yeah, I will say as, as someone who does coaching as well and has been doing coaching for a while, 
I'm always surprised by how well we do with this. When I get a new client and start working with them after a session, or two, I feel like, of course, you're my client. You couldn't be anybody else's client. You were meant to be working with me. Um, so most of the time we have that feeling. And most of the time when we reach out to the client a week or two in and say, how are you feeling about your coach? My coach is wonderful. I feel like I've known them a long time. I feel like they really get me. So something about how we do that process is working well. I think mm -hmm. goes to the huge diversity in our coaches. Um, we had an intake recently of a client whose passion is French horn and harpsichord playing. And as it happens, we have a coach who was the first French horn in the Boston Symphony and also teaches harpsichord lessons. So it just happened that we had someone who was a really wonderful fit for that client. Um, and sometimes, you know, that it may be outside of coaching proper, but sometimes that shared interest, that shared hobby, whatever it might be, can be a great basis for a coach and a client to form a connection in the beginning so that they can start to work together. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Lori, hang on. Yes, go ahead, yes. Lori. Hi, thank you Hi. so much. Very, very interesting and pertinent. I was just discussing, you know, goals and things with Callum's coach and, and him and, and uh, yeah, so a lot of things are going through my mind. One question is the, um, how important is it to actually have the measurable um, goals, like you say, your anxiety confidence measure, um, do the kids or people, um, mm -hmm. do they get a lot out of seeing where, where they were at one point and how they've moved up on the scales? It varies, but I think most of them really do like that. Um, and, and many of them will say to us, my teachers or my parents pointed out areas where I still needed to make more progress. And I don't feel like people have pointed out to me when I've been successful. Mm -hmm. So they'll, they'll say, I do appreciate that you're showing me how I've grown or how I've made progress. Um, and of course, there are some who that's really not a big deal to them. Yeah. Uh, they just do you want find from your side that it's very important to have the measurability like I think so. Approach. I, I think it helps our coaches, um, especially during this pandemic time. Virtual coaching is different. It has its pros and cons, certainly. But it can feel to our coaches like, my goodness, I've been working on the same thing with this client since the dawn of time. Uh, and, and to be able to go back and show the coach, look, when you started with them four months ago, look at what they were working on and look where you are now. Yes. Yeah. It's usually important to the client, but it's always, almost always important to our coaches as well. Okay, thank you. Um, one other question. I, sure. um, you said that most of your coaches have masters or doctorates. Um, mm -hmm. Is that completely necessary or? No, we do have some with bachelor's degrees and just a lot of experience, um, whether it's personal experience, life experience, or... Um, trying to think we have a few with bachelor's degrees who worked in who worked as paraprofessionals not sure if that's a term in Canada as well but they worked in the classroom assisting students with autism or Asperger's and have a lot of experience that way yeah so no not essential but just happens to be the case that many of our coaches do oh the other reason that we have to look for those coaches is two of our funding sources which are DDS and the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Council, they require our coaches to have at least a master's degree. Yeah, um, okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions about how we, how this all happens? It's been interesting for me working for LifeMap to watch during the pandemic. We've had several different trends that are, are really interesting. First, there's a group of clients who I think are doing better in virtual coaching than they were in in-person coaching. I know a handful of them that I can talk to about that very explicitly. And they'll say, if we were meeting in a library or coffee shop or somewhere on my college campus, the noise, the sounds, all the people, all the sensory input would overwhelm me. And I couldn't really focus on our conversation about coaching. 
But when I'm at home in my comfortable chair with my cat and my weighted blanket, I feel like I am more comfortable and I'm more able to take risks than I would be in in-person coaching. We also have some clients who really absolutely loathe virtual coaching and cannot wait until we, can, we return to in-person coaching. So that as well. Um, and I don't think this is related to the pandemic itself, but we have noticed a tremendous increase in uh, women applicants, I would say over the age of 30 and even more over the age of 40. So just to, to give you a couple of clients, uh, this is, these are real clients with their names changed, of course. We have a client currently named Ken, who was identified as being on the autism spectrum when he was, I believe, about 23 months old. He speaks and reads and writes seven languages, believe it or not. He's one of my clients. Um, and he's having a, a surgery later this month. And I would be concerned about the surgery during the pandemic. His gnawing question is, I have a four week recovery period. What language shall I learn during those four weeks? And I said, you can learn an entire language, speak, reading, and writing in four weeks. He said, it's a luxurious amount of time not a problem for him. He has perfect pitch. He's very musically talented as well. He has struggled his whole life with hygiene, time management, social interaction. When I first started working with him, his goal, goals were to finish his bachelor's degree, which he's done, and to remember to brush his teeth every day, which I found so fascinating that this individual who can speak seven languages fluently said, I can't, I've set alarms, I've put signs on the bathroom mirror and I just never get my teeth brushed and it bothers people around to me. I can't take credit for the fact that we've changed this. What actually solved this problem was having to wear a mask every day. So he was breathing his own breath. And he said, <laughs> he said, now I brush my own teeth because I can't stand how my own breath smells if I don't, <laughs> which I sort of love. Uh, and he's currently finishing a year at City Year, which is a, a social service program in this country, working in an elementary school with kids with, on the spectrum. And he's going to an incredibly competitive program at the University of Toronto in 2021 in the fall. He's living in his own apartment. He has friends and he's gotten several commendations um, from City Year for his outstanding work as a member of their team. So... That's one example of a client that we might have, we do have at the moment. Another client that we have right now, Ellen, uh, sought evaluation when she was about 41 when a nephew was identified as having an autism spectrum disorder. When we did her intake, she told us, I have been diagnosed as bipolar, as schizoid personality, as borderline personality, as depressed, long list of diagnoses. And she said, when I, finally got the diagnosis of being on the autism spectrum, it made sense to me. It felt right. It felt like that's, that is who I am. She has lived with her mother her entire life and has a goal of living independently. While she has held jobs and many jobs, she's never, never holds on to them for very long. She said, I'm usually the first person let go if there's a reason that they're firing people. Her goals coming into coaching were to better understand her own profile because she's new. This diagnosis is new. Uh, and she said, you know, I've never really had a friend, uh, which is a sad thing to hear from someone over 40. So I'd like to have a friend or two, someone I could take a walk with or knit with or something. And she said, I'd really like to have an intimate relationship at some point in my life. So those are her two goals uh, working with her coach at this point. Okay, um, our two programs for, for similar populations at AANE are Life Map, which is what I've been talking about so far, and Life Net. Life Map stands for Life Management Assistance Program. Uh, we provide coaching to focus on things like self awareness and self advocacy. We do a lot of college coaching, more now than ever, especially with college being virtual. Many of our clients say, I don't know how to access disability services. I'm not on the campus. I can't just walk into that office and get accommodations, help. So our coach will go with them online to support services on campus. 
We do a lot of pre-employment and employment coaching. We coach related to independent living, self-care and accessing things in the community. Uh, executive functioning is probably very high on the list of topics that we coach for. Relationships and social skills. And we focus just on developing and building skills, fine tuning skills. Um, relationship just reminded me of a young man whose intake I did last week. And I said, do you have any idea what your goals might be? He's 17, so quite young. And he said, yes, I want to get a girlfriend. And there was just something about the way he said it. I pictured him walking up to a vending mas machine and putting money in and pressing B7 or something. He, it just, that language was just so interesting. I'm going to get a girlfriend. Life net is quite different. It's more of um, a case management service, really. So LifeNet focuses on uh, wraparound services. It assesses and prioritizes an adult's ongoing independent living needs. It helps arrange and coordinate between multiple service providers for an adult. The LifeNet provider will monitor our client's overall health and well-being, and will go with that client to appointments or errands and guide them in other independent living activities, and will help them advocate for services with other agencies, such as DDS, for example. In Life Map, our questions that we look at focus on how can I achieve the goal that's most important in my life right now? What is the most important goal right now? What are my priorities right now? In Life Net, the question is more, um, who's going to help me live when my parents are gone? And gone can mean that they've passed away. It can also mean that they're ready to retire to Florida and Massachusetts winters just aren't their thing anymore, thanks. Uh, and they want to move away, but they need to know that their adult child has supports, has, has the supports that they need. In Life Map, our focus is teaching or empowering our clients to do things for themselves. In Life Net, it's a bit different than that. Their focus tends to be on supporting the adults by empowering them when they can or doing things on their behalf if, that's, if, if doing it themselves is beyond their ability. Sometimes it's goal-oriented, sometimes it's just support. So, for example, with a life map client, we would coach them on how to find people to spend time with, how to find social groups, how to find somebody to play video games with, or somebody to play music with, or somebody who loves baseball in the same way they do. At LifeNet, they would actually provide that companionship to the client. Life map averages about one or two hours a week. I think the most at this point that we have a client on is actually four hours per week. Life net averages two to three, two to five hours a week. I think some of them are even a bit higher. And life net has tiered service depending on the needs of the client. Our average life map client works with us about 24 weeks, where life net client often work with LifeNet for many years, perhaps for their whole adult life. At LifeMap, we have an hourly fee where LifeNet is an annual fee. Uh, and I should say as well that LifeMap, we have many, many funding sources. We have scholarships, uh, Department of Developmental Services, Mass Rehab Commission. Some colleges pay for us, some public schools pay for us. We have a client right now who's funded by the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind. Um, and I think we're actually up to seven states vocational rehabilitation services that will pay for life map coaching. LifeNet right now is completely a private pay program and it's quite expensive. Their number one goal in the LifeNet program at this time is to get approval for DDS and MRC funding because many families cannot afford the cost of LifeNet. Life map, it's very much a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the coach and the client. There's a clinical team behind the scenes, so our coaches always have people they can come back to with clinical questions. 
and our clinical team, including myself, pr we provide ongoing training to our coaches um, regularly. We have a, a weekly meeting called Coffee with Coaches where a coach can just drop in with questions about a situation with a client and get support from us. And our, at LifeMap, the unstated goal is that we're going to diminish that client's need for coaching over time. At LifeNet, the client usually has many, many people working with them. They'll have their life net worker, uh, life net case manager, maybe two or three life net people who come to their house, come to their apartment, take them out to appointments, maybe a therapist, maybe several other agencies. So it's a more, there, there's a bigger support team for life net clients. And it's sort of expected that a life net client is going to continue to need support and maybe need more support over the span of their lifetime. At LifeMap, um, we aren't case managers. We don't do that. If a client is working through an agency like the DDS or like MRC, they might have a case manager there and they'll loop us in, they'll loop our coaches in, but we ourselves are not case management folks. Uh, we don't do on-call or emergency hours or that sort of thing. And we also don't tutor our clients, uh, although we get a lot of requests for parents for tutoring. LifeNet, we don't do coaching there. We don't prepare our clients for interviewing or college prep, and we don't work with teenagers. LifeNet clients, as a rule, are 20 at the very youngest. Many are in their mid to late 20s or older. Questions about those two? I have a question. It's Lori again. Hi. Hi. I'm just wondering, you mentioned that you've uh, worked with like three universities or kind of studying what you do. Are there mm -hmm. any uh, reports that we can access about your, um, your organization and, and, and the LifeNet and LifeMap? Yes, I can definitely have those. I can send those to Joette if you'd like. That'd be great. Sure. I find it always very, very interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. It's interesting for us too, um, just to see how we're doing and see how our needs change, see how our requests change. Um, I mean, we know some of it because we, we tally a good bit of it up at the end of each month. I can say that over the past six months, requests to work with a coach at LifeMap who is on the spectrum are up several hundred percent. Uh, that was a very rare request until recently, and now it's quite a common request. So, do, you, do you work with Canadians as well, or is it strictly Americans? Oh, no, we have Canadians. We have several Canadian clients, Costa Rican, Iraqi, uh, clients in Mumbai. We have clients everywhere at this point. Wow. Yeah. That's all I had for you, but I'm more than happy to take questions, to talk to you about our model or our program. Uh, about Life uh, Net? Yes. Um, the people involved in that program, are they, do they tend to be those with more severe difficulties? They do tend to be. Um, with our life map clients, the assumption is that they will be able to live more or less independently at some point. Um, and our life net clients, the assumption is they're going to continue to need support and probably a team of support as they move on into their adulthood. Okay, so I guess that brings me to my next question, mm -hmm. which is it seems like there should be something between those two extremes. You just anticipated what's starting for us in July. Um, <laughs> we we um, have been approached by the Department of Developmental Services and asked to take a fairly large cohort of individuals who would under other circumstances be life net clients. But as I mentioned at this point, that's all private pay and it's a rare family who can afford to pay for that. So we've agreed to take a, a, this large cohort. We have new staff coming on board to work with them. Um, and that we hope will start to bridge the gap between the two. Really what we're hoping for, and we've got a, a large team of people working on this, is that agencies like DDS and MRC will ultimately fund LifeNet for our clients going forward, for the clients who need, need that. Uh, but in the interim, we're going to have a whole new co cohort 
and it looks like a large cohort at this point, who will be working through LifeMap, but they're going to look a lot more like LifeNet clients. And at least here in the United States, apparently there's a bill that's been passed specifically for people who have aged out of our special education system, which you can stay until you're 21 here. But the last year and a half, of course, school has not been what it would have been under other circumstances. So many families are saying, yes, they stayed till they were 21, but the last year and a half, they did not get the services that they should have. And so there's funding available in our country for those people to access this program uh, as sort of a compensatory education for things that were missing from their special ed education during the pandemic. And as my, my understanding is a fair number of that cohort are coming in on that funding stream. Mm -hmm. Two, I should say too, we have had clients who start as LifeMap clients and work with us in LifeMap for a certain amount of time. And then as they get older um, and their parents realize we do want to retire to Mexico or Florida or what have you, or we're just tired and we need to have the confidence that our adult child will be well cared for, they will transition into becoming a LifeNet client. That absolutely happens. Uh, one more question, if you don't mind. Oh, please, ask away. And, and, and I'm really looking forward to getting your notes. I'm sure they'll be much better than ones I've been taking. <laughs> um, <hope> so. <laughs> the Department of Developmental Services is something yes. you've referred to a number of times mm -hmm. as a result of uh, as, as a source of, of funding and resources and that kind of thing. What, ex what exactly, what role exactly does that play in the government in the United States? Okay, uh, we have two different agencies. Department of Developmental Services is for anybody with any, identified with any sort of developmental disorder. So you can imagine that's all of our folks with autism and Asperger's, individuals with Down syndrome, a host of other conditions. And the De Department of Developmental Services funds an incredible number of things for them. Through the pandemic, to my complete surprise, they've actually been funding virtual companions for some of our clients. Now, is that a state level or a federal level? Um, each state has its own branch of it, and there's some variation between states, but the, the federal government says that each state must provide the service. So it doesn't look quite the same, say where I'm in Maine as it does in Massachusetts, but exists in each of our states. Thank you. You're welcome. And they, as I said, I've been amazed. Uh, my client that I mentioned who needs to meet with me 15 minutes each morning, that's really about his attention span. The Department of Developmental Services through the pandemic is paying uh, an older, but still young man to play video games with my client twice a week. So they're paying for companionship. And this older person is helping my client. If he gets angry during a video game and is looking like he's going to fling the controller, his paid companion can say, wow, you, you saved a long time to buy that. I know you're frustrated right now, but let's think of something else you might do rather than break that, that thing that means so much to you. Um, they pay for just a, a host of services for clients. Our other main funding source is state level rehabilitation commissions. Every state here has that. Um, I'm not sure how it works in Canada. Maine has a Department of Rehabilitative Services. Massachusetts has one. And they tend to fund clients only if they're working on job related goals. It could be pre-employment, it could be interview skills, it could be writing a resume, it could be getting into a certificate program for a trade or an apprenticeship, but their focus is vocational in nature. So that's a little bit more of a narrow funding stream for our clients. Is, is that federal as well? Yes, there, there's a federal rehabilitation commission and then each state has their own variant on it. But we've been having great luck. I think, as I said, we're up to maybe six or seven states now that do fund our clients. Um, what happens here is that we get um, autism intervention functioning of uh, funding unst until 19, age 19. And then they're, uh, they have to reapply as adults. And many adults uh, with, aut with Asperger profiles get dropped because they're um, perceived to have a level of adaptive functioning 
as uh, too high to justify adult funding. And the, it, it, that's really problematic because it's a narrow view of what it takes to be funding success, uh, fu to be uh, functional uh, successfully in life, right? Um, it is, yes, you know, right. Just because you can tie your shoelaces doesn't necessarily mean you can handle the social interactions in a workplace. And those individuals that get dropped, the first to be dropped, are those ones who don't, who are less able to in work on teams, get, um, uh, you know, get the nuances of being in a social, the, the social aspects of being in a workplace. So yeah. anyway, so for many of our individuals, um, there's nothing out there for them um, as adults. And as well, that kind of approach where you get dropped at 19, doesn't recognize it's a lifetime condition, you know, no. that it, it, so, so there are a bunch of issues. There are lots of services, specialist employment agencies that do focus on that narrow range of interview skills, um, uh, writing resumes, um, talking about workplace expectations, but Again, many of those services are telling us that um, if individuals don't have mental health supports or if they're totally depressed because of their lack of social engagement or they're carrying a bunch of baggage because of having um, uh, been bullied in school previously. And so I totally get what you're saying about them having a long list of things that they can just describe about things that they need to work on and two things that they think they're good at, right? And right. how do you, put, right. how do you, how do you um, put yourself forward as a potential hiree if you don't, if you see yourself in such negative terms? And so um, uh, those it is, uh, specialist employment agencies are really struggling with the fact that they don't get support around those ancillary things that make up a whole person that they that they can confidently um, um, put themselves forward in the workplace. So it's interesting that you mentioned that. I just had a woman that I spoke with yesterday who works for an organization called Higher Autism here in the United States. And there's strictly a job placement service. And she said, we're finding that we're placing clients and then they're not holding on to the job. And so they want to contract with us to provide coaching after they get the client the job for exactly the, the reasons you're talking about. Right. Such, it, I think of success as a vitamin, which is just my image for it. And if you've become deficient in it over your lifetime, it will show up in every way in how you present yourself to the world. And you're right, you will not be able to hold on to a job and negotiate the social nuances of it. It's so what you're talking about uh, has a great deal of appeal for us because it, it at its core understands that we have to customize um, the supports to the individual and we have to um, go beyond that narrow range of focus that governments are always interested in. Can we put this person in, a, in an office space or a workplace? And um, yes, we all want that. They want that too for their, their self-sufficiency and for their, um, their uh, well-being. But if the other aspects aren't addressed, it's like unlikely to be successful. It's very true. And that, that's an issue with many of our state departments of rehabilitation. Uh, my son, who's 27, started working with our state's vocational rehabilitation, but I quickly found that they had just no understanding of him. Um, they said, well, we'll send someone to teach him how to balance a checkbook. Uh, entirely unnecessary. He can balance my checkbook better than I can. But workplace nuances, as you say, much more difficult for him. Um, so while we do have the departments, it the efficacy with which different states handle our population varies tremendously, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Massachusetts does quite a good job, I would say. Um, they've worked hard and they were actually, they contract with us to provide a lot of training 
to their rehabilitation counselors. I'm taking part in a week long training from Massachusetts rehabilitation counselors in August to help them better understand our population, which I think is really to their credit that they realize this is a population we're seeing more of, we're not well-trained, we need to learn more. And so they reached out and said, can you come and do training for us? Which yeah. jumped at the opportunity, of course. Have you ever tried life mapping or the life map program as a group thing where you have, um, you know- We're starting to, yeah, it's interesting. A lot of coaches have come to us and said, I have these two clients or I have these three clients and they're so similar and their goals are so similar. And um, in many instances, especially if you're working on social interaction, the one-on-one -on -one model isn't ideal for that. So we're, we're piloting it with a few particular coaches and a few little groups at this point. But I think I can see us moving in that way for some clients and in some situations. We're also just starting to offer, uh, this is something I'm working on, we're just starting to offer family support groups for life map clients. We're finding that a lot of parents, more so parents of our younger clients, uh, you know, their client is, or their child is 19 or 20, just out of high school. The parent knows they should be pulling back a little, but they don't know how or how much. There's no manual for that. And then the coach will call us and say, this parent is in every coaching se session and they're talking over everything I say and they're not letting the client speak. So we're now starting to offer more family groups for families of life map clients. I think that's an important thing because um, first of all, um, it's just as you said, parents have gotten in the habit of translating the autistic experience to the neurotypical world. And it's, it's hard to pull back from that, even though they know they should and they want to, but um, they don't know how, that's one thing. And the other thing I think is that um, they, their young adult often doesn't have the cohort of, of friends who have their back. And That's so, um, and so um, the parent is gap filling. They, <laughs> um, they um, you know, it may be uh, even as basic as just personal security. They feel the, the vulnerable, you know, whereas um, the 17, 16, 17 and 18 year olds are in the, in the neurotypical community are traveling about with pals that will have their, have look out for them. And um, our individuals um, had to negotiate that journey by themselves. Erin, um, I just wondered, um, Joanne, I wondered how Erin feels about what Betty has just explained. He's such a, a smart, articulate, handsome man. <laughs> I'd like to know what he thinks of this program and whether Betty knows of any other programs in the world that are like hers. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting concept. Uh, I definitely think that I would benefit from social coaching because socialization is something that I've struggled with as a person who's not neurotypical. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the biggest barrier for me would be the cost because as you were saying, the LifeNet program is quite expensive and I'm not in a position where I can afford to completely fund myself living at home with my parents. I think okay. that you would need, the, 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 the best option for you would be the Life Map program because we fully believe that you will be, I mean, partly you're, you're um, moving out into, onto your own. Your whole employment thing has been protracted a little bit because of COVID, but mm. we for <laughs> sure um, see you being capable of living independently on your own. And so it's, it's exactly as you said around the social thing that we'd like to see some of those things in place um, before you're completely out there on your own. You could cook, that's a good thing. <laughs> 
And just a couple other things that, that Aaron's comments brought to mind. I think Life Map would be a better fit, just a tiny minute that I've gotten to know you. But we also do have a lot of free social programs online for both parent, we have parents groups, grandparents groups, spouses groups. Uh, and then just for fun, we have an improv group, we have a writer's group, we have game night, trivia night. We have just an endless number right now of social opportunities online. Um, I've gone to game night once at a client who's a bit nervous about going. He said, what if I don't know anyone? And I said, I've never been to one. So how about I go? I like playing games. So I went with him and it was a great time. We had a, we had a wonderful time together and he's kept going and enjoyed it very, very much. Uh, so we do, we have that available. You know, we've been doing something before we even knew about you. We mm -hmm. um, uh, have been doing some similar things. We're much smaller, and we're um, and we're we need have lots of work to do on broadening our reach. But we have had over over this COVID winter a movie night uh, with discussion, a games night, um, a yoga thing. Um, and uh, what a uh, program that we call Confident Conversations, which is social skills through uh, drama games. Oh, um, I just had a question as well, um, because you said you had clients all, well, I'm not sure all over the world, but I mean, beyond the US. Um, so how do you help coach them like through Zoom or, or, or yep, do they Zoom, have, lo um, do you have, lo do you know locally where they're from, if they are we're, we're uh, doing coaches. it all remotely at this point, even in Massachusetts, because yeah. the are so high. So it's Zoom, Skype, FaceTime. I don't know if any of you know the platform Discord. Apparently gamers oh, yeah. mm -hmm. when they game. I have a Discord account now because that was the only platform one of my clients was comfortable with. So we Discord. Um, so any any platform that will work, really. Do you foresee that continuing beyond uh, COVID? I absolutely think it will. Uh, I think our, our, we're forever changed now by how much we've grown, mm -hmm. uh, which is, it's wonderful. I mean, in the, the big picture, when I sit back and think all of these people who would not have gotten support are getting it now. And that mm -hmm. is ultimately wonderful. It, we're going through some growing pains. We need more multilingual coaches desperately. Um, We've had requests to coach in, in Hebrew, in Farsi. Uh, we have a few coaches that speak other languages, but not as many as we would like. Uh, we need more male coaches, certainly. Do you run a coaching training program? We do. Um, we train coaches. Um, there's a program called Asper Coach that didn't happen last year because of COVID, but it's a five-day training that we run. And it sets coaches up to come in be trained, and then if they choose to, they can go home and set up their own coaching business. Mm. It, it includes everything from our coaching model to how to run the business yourself. Mm -hmm. and what we found now, excuse me, during COVID times is we're reaching out to our Asper coaches. We just hired one of them from Idaho because she's been running a successful coaching business for 10 years on her own, and we need coaches closer to West Coast time. So we just said, you know, we, we'd like to hire you to be our coach now. And she said, well, if I don't have to manage the whole taxes and business end, I can take more clients. So sure. Um, so we do coach trainings. Yes. Um, one of the things that um, I'd like to see um, us putting more of our members in touch with your, your members for free, some of the free programs, the time change is a bit brutal, though. That it's hard, isn't it? It's yeah. hard because of all of those social programs that are mostly evening run things. Not all, but some, but they are. And that puts it, um, you know, uh, too early because it's still in our work day for us. But um, some things are, and I'll, I'll comb through them a little bit more carefully. And some of them you record as well. And uh, for, for people who aren't able to attend a program can attend them later. So I'm going to be... Um, particularly around the uh, sexuality ones and the couples oh, yes. relationship ones. Mm -hmm. I'd like to um, see if we can collaborate a bit more on some of those. That would be fantastic. We've started doing mon monthly trainings for our coaches and our AAPCA members who are people running their own coaching, but they in general have been trained by us, not all of them. 
Uh, and those are, have all been recorded so that you can access those. Um, okay, one on working with parents, one on social skills, one on employment. Um, I'm doing one coming up in June on using visuals, creating things that are visual for clients um, remotely, a particular area of interest of mine. Um, so yes, those are all being recorded and will be available for folks to watch. I do think we're gonna to continue to coach all over the world. We just have some growing pains. We have to find maybe some of our younger uh, folks who run those, those social groups to run them later at night here so that it works on the West Coast. Um, right, for sure. The other yeah. thing is that I noticed a lot of your programs have um, uh, individuals, they're co-hosted or co-facilitated with somebody on the spectrum. And yes. uh, I would like very much to do more of that ourselves. We totally recognize how important it is to have qualified facilitators, and we've paid a lot of attention to that. But um, having more people on the spectrum as part of the um, uh, organizational end of it would be great. I, I'm not sure of the exact number, but I believe at aa &E, about 40% of our employees are on the spectrum, and we're a pretty large organization. So when we have whole staff meetings, there are times when a joke will sort of happen among employees on the spectrum and the rest of us don't get it. And I actually love it when that happens because I feel like that gives me a little glimpse into what it must feel like for them very often. Um, and they'll sort of type in the chat, oh, so sorry you didn't understand. <laughs> but yeah, I really enjoy that. Um, you know, you still didn't answer my question. Do you know of any in. other organization in the world that's doing the same thing you're doing or something similar? I do not at this point, no. And and Danya, who I trust completely, Danya Jekyll founded a 25 years ago. This is just one woman's idea grew into this organization that truly I can't keep track from day to day of all of our offerings. I'll I'll pop onto the website with a client and there'll be six more things there that weren't there the day before. It's, it's astonishing what's growing, but no, I don't. I don't know of another organization that has child and family services, adult services, activity groups. We have programs in Spanish. We have, yeah, we, we have so much going on. You're, uh, you're doing a wraparound approach to the individual. We're certainly trying to. Um, we absolutely are trying to. And that's been another challenge, honestly, of this remote, remote world. We have a client right now in Georgia who unfortunately has become homeless. His stepmother and father kicked him out of their house uh, and he's living in his truck. And he's not even allowed to go in and use the restroom or get water or anything else. Now, if he were homeless in Massachusetts or Maine or New Hampshire, anywhere up in New England, we know agency after agency that we could connect him to for help. We don't in Georgia, so we're, we're scrambling, trying to find support to put around this young man in rural South Georgia at this point. Uh, and that's a new position for us. And the same with clients you know, in other states or other countries. A little bit difficult because we don't have necessarily the knowledge in those places that we do in our own backyard. I have to say it's my favorite place I've ever worked. Um, when any of us has a need or has to be out for any reason, a family member needs us, it's the most supportive group of people I've ever worked with in my life. And I have to say, I absolutely love our clients. I can be in a really foul sort of pandemic temper and meet with a client and it, it just turns around instantly. Or even conducting intakes with clients. I had a client the other day when I asked about sensory issues, do you have sensory sensitivities? He told me that he hated all fruit. <laughs> I said, I've not heard that from anybody before. I said, do you hate all fruit equally? And he said, I do not. I despise bananas. <laughs> I said, I'm going to write that down because it sounds important. And he said, I'm going to go further. I decry the existence of bananas on planet earth. <laughs> I got to hear that sentence and write it down just made me immensely happy. When I asked why, he said, have you ever felt the outside of a banana? What made somebody feel that and think that it was an edible thing? He said, it feels like plastic food in a restaurant. It does not feel edible. <laughs> I love our job. Uh, and one more client story. This is probably my favorite one of the pandemic. 
one of my clients was so sad over the holidays because it didn't feel right. It just didn't feel like the holidays should. And he was quite depressed and he sort of pulled himself up and he said, okay, I'm not going to wallow. He said, I have a question. What do you think will be the good that comes out of the pandemic? And it took me so by surprise, given his gloomy mood a second before, and I said, what do you mean? And he said, wars are horrible. No one will argue that wars are a good thing. But out of our wars, we've gotten much of our technology and much of our medical knowledge. So good things came from them. He said, I'm going to assume that some good things will come from this pandemic. And he's actually started a Google Doc that we share where he writes down his idea of what might be positive changes after the pandemic. And my very favorite one on his list is, I'm hopeful that after this pandemic, neurotypicals won't know how to make eye contact anymore. <laughs> so much time on Zoom meetings and maybe once and for all, people will get off my case about eye contact. Thanks, Betty. Oh, you're so welcome. It was lovely to meet all of you.